Hare 
भगवत Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and to Srila Vyasada, the author. By regular attendance of the classes of Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering service to pure devotees, almost everything which is troublesome to the heart is, will be gradually, will be almost uh, completely vanquished and the loving service to the Supreme Lord will become an irrevocable fact. Thank you very much for Eskilia Kelkan Kri Palo Pa Anglais. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this great honor to read from Srila Prabhupada Lamrita from Sasvarup Das Goswami. Please give me your blessings because you are more qualified to, to read this than me. And uh, please give me your blessings that I can do it for the pleasure of Srila Prabhupada, Shishi Guru Parampara, Shishi Radha Govinda Madhava, Shri Krishna Balarana, Shishi Gornitai. So we are... <laughs> so we are uh, on the chapter which is called Beyond the Lower East Side and it is uh, in the year one moment, I will tell you in a moment well I guess it is in 65 55 or 66 anyway um, we are in New York and uh, Srila Prabhupada has just started uh, the preaching in the Lower East Side, the, uh, the quarter in New York. And uh, we were hearing last time how he was preaching very boldly uh, to, to the young people, mostly hippies, about uh, regulative principles. And he was um, suggested that he doesn't mentioned to, to uh, 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 regulate the, the sex life, to propagate uh, uh, restraint from Ill illicit sex, but Srila Prabhupada would not compromise on, on these principles. So we will continue there. Uh, Judson Hall on West 57th Street cost $200 to rent for one night. Raya Ram thought it was time Swamiji tried reaching some of the more sophisticated New Yorkers. And since Judson Hall was near Carnegie Hall and sometimes had interesting concerts and lectures, he thought it would be a good place to start. Swamiji agreed to the idea and Raya Ram printed an announcement which he distributed in the Midtown bookstores. On the night of the event, the devotees paraded through the Midtown entertainment areas, 
beating a bass drum and handling out leaflets. Then they tried, then they returned to Justin Hall for the program. Only seven people attended. The devotees felt terrible. They had misled Swamiji and spent the equivalent of a month's rent. We can cancel the program if you like, Swamiji, Raya Rama said. But Prabhupada replied, No, let us chant and speak. So the devotees took the stage and chanted with Swamiji and danced, and then sat beside him as he lectured, his voice echoing through the empty hall. Afterward, Swamiji called for questions. The young man, about 15, about 15 vacant rows back, asked whether he was correct in understanding that Swami's philosophy was primarily for reforming destitute young people. No, Prabhupada replied. Everyone in this material world is lost and destitute. Even the so-called successful person, because everyone has forgotten Krishna. After the program, Swamiji sat in a chair by the exit as the few members of the audience were leaving. A respectable-looking couple introduced themselves, and Swamiji sat up very straight with folded palms and smiled. Brahmananda, Brahmananda's mother was present, and Swamiji was very cordial towards her. But in general, the devotees were depressed at the small turnout. I'm sorry, Swamiji, we invited you here, and, no, and almost no one came. Raya Ram apologized. But Prabhupada raised his eyebrows and said, No one? You did not see Narada? You did not see Lord Brahma? When there is chanting of Hare Krishna, even the demigods come to participate. Back at the temple, Prabhupada chided Raya Ram. I told you, we should have charged money. When something is free, people think it is worthless. But just charge three dollars or five dollars and people will think, Oh, you are offering some very valuable thing. In Bengal, there is the story of a man who went house to house offering free mangoes. And no one would take these mangoes because everyone thought, Oh, why is he giving away these mangoes? There must be something wrong with them. So, he charged three rupees. And then they thought, These look like good mangoes. The price is only three rupees. All right. So, when people see that something is free, they think it is worthless. Charge them some money, and they will think it is very nice. Be free if you have any comments to, to add something. Burton Green was a musician, fond of the Swami and fond of banging on the innards of the piano in the temple during Kirtan. Burton Green. We had a really explosive thing to break out of with this capitalistic, materialistic egg sitting on us. So there was so much ferocity in the music to break out of. But spinning out like that, you could have a nervous breakdown. So it was great to go to the Swamis and chant in his small storefront on 2nd Avenue. The streets were full of Maya and perversion, and his was a place to really mellow out. It was great to chant there, to balance my life. It was great to sit and have prasadam with the Swami and get some real authentic Indian cooking and chapatis and talk about things especially when I had very little money in my pocket. It was always nice to go. When Burton asked Prabhupada to attend his piano recital at Town Hall Theatre, Prabhupada agreed. Brahmananda, about seven or eight of us in our sneakers and jeans 
had ridden on the subway with Swamiji to town hall. We went in and took our seats and the concert began. Burton Green came out, opened the piano top, took a hammer and began violently hitting on the strings inside the piano. And it went on for an hour and a half. We were all sitting there with Swamiji and we all began chanting on our beats. There were only about two dozen people in the whole theater. Then the intermission came and Swamiji wanted to go to the toilet room and I went along and helped him, turning on the water in the sink, getting a paper towel for him. Doing these little services for Swamiji seemed like a, the perfection of my life. There was something so great about him that just doing those things was my perfection. And I felt like I was protecting him, like I was his personal bodyguard. Coming up on the subway, I had shown him how the subway worked and answered his questions. It all seemed very intimate. Anyway, we went back, back upstairs to our seats and Burton Green came right up, right up to, to Swamiji saying, Swamiji, are you happy? Are you comfortable? Do you like it? And Swamiji was very polite and said yes. Then Burton said, now the second part is coming. I interrupted and tried to say, the Swamiji is very tired and he takes rest at 10. It was already after 10, so I said we had to go back. But he pressed Swamiji to stay for the second half, and so we had to stay. Then the poets came out and recited poetry. We were there until 11.30, and then we had to ride back on the subway. But a few weeks later, I learned that Prabhupada had another reason for going to town hall. He was thinking of renting it for a temple, and he wanted to see it. Next chapter. The Gate Theatre was a small auditorium on 2nd Avenue, about 10 blocks north of the storefront. Satsvarup. We rented the Gate Theatre for one night. It was a dark place, painted all black. The theater was almost empty. We had an easel on stage with the painting of the Pancha Tattva. Swamiji spoke and his talk became very technical. Pointing and referring back to the painting, he described each member of the Pancha Tattva. He first explained that Lord Chaitanya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead appearing as a pure devotee. Lord Nityananda to the right of Lord Chaitanya is his first expansion, and to the right of Lord Nityananda is Advaita, who is the incarnation of the Supreme Lord. To the left of Lord Chaitanya, he said, is Gadadhar, the internal energy, and Srivas is the perfect devotee. During the talk, I was thinking that this was maybe too elevated for the audience. But I was sitting close beside Swamiji, and like the other devotees, I was really enjoying being with him. After the gate engagement, Swamiji and his disciples agreed that it was a waste of time trying to rent theaters. It was better to go to Tompkins Square Park. That was the best place for attracting people, and it didn't cost anything. It's amazing how they started just in the temple, they worship Panchatattva picture. So this was the beginning of deity worship, and from there it grew, and we have so opulent, wonderful deities, and dressing them every day. It was 11 p.m. and only one light was on in Swamiji's apartment, in the kitchenette. Swamiji was staying up 
teaching Kirtanananda and Brahmananda how to cook. Because the next day, Sunday, they would be holding a feast for the public. Kirtanananda had suggested it be advertised as a love feast. And Swamiji had adopted the name, although some thought it sounded strange at first to hear him say love feast. The devotees had put up posters around the neighborhood and had made a sign for the window of the storefront. And Swamiji had said he would cook enough for at least 50 people. He said the love feast should become an important part of ISKCON. As he, ex as he had explained many times, food offered to Krishna becomes spiritual and whoever eats the prasadam receives great spiritual benefit. Prasadam means meant mercy. His two helpers stood respectfully beside him, sometimes stepping back out of his way as he moved and sometimes looking over his shoulder as he mixed spices or set the pan over the flame or called for another ingredient. He was stirring a big pot of sweet rice with a wooden spoon. It had to be stirred constantly and slowly adding milk. If the sweet rice burned, it would be ruined, he said. And he handed the spoon to Kirtanananda. He next showed them how to make ghee by heating butter in a wok and separating the milk solids from the butter fat. And he simultaneously taught them how to make apple chutney. Prabhupada was silent as he cooked, but when Brahmananda asked him how he had learned so much about cooking, Prabhupada said that he had learned by watching his mother. He laughed and said, it had not been like it is in the West, where you, take, where you take a lump of flesh from your refrigerator, throw it in a pan, boil it, sprinkle it with salt, and then eat like an animal. And in Korea, he said, they eat dogs. But human beings should eat grains, fruits, vegetables and milk, and the cow especially should not be killed. While Brahmananda cut the apples for the chutney and put them in a pot for steaming and Kirtanananda stirred the sweet rice, Swamiji prepared masala, the basic mixture of spices, which he would soon add to the steaming apples. The familiar smell of red pepper and cumin seeds entered their nostrils sharply as the masala crackled and smoked in the hot ghee in the tiny frying pan. With three separate operations going at once, sweet rice, steaming apples and masala, Prabhupada cautioned Kirtanananda to stir the sweet rice steadily and scrape the bottom of the pot. And he took the spoon for a moment from Kirtanananda's hand and demonstrated how to stir it properly. Sweet rice, chutney and certain other dishes could be made in advance of the feast, he explained, but many things would have to be done the next morning. Prabhupada rose early, despite having kept late hours the night before, and after the morning class, he was back in the kitchen. Now, half a dozen disciples sat in his front room making dough for puris and samosas. He had shown them how to make the dough, and Umapati had kneaded for a while by pounding the soft dough with his fist. But Brahmanananda was better at it, soaking the weight of his restless body onto the larger lump of dough. As Swamiji entered the room to examine the quality of the puris, his disciples looked up at him respectfully. They were always serious when he was present. He picked up a puri and examined it. It is not to the standard, he said, but it will have to do. Then, amid crumpled rejects and oddly shaped pieces of dough, he squatted down beside his helpers, 
who were trying as best they could, though making a mess. He took a small ball of dough, pressed it flat with his fingers, and then deftly rolled it out until it curled around the wooden pin and then fell off. A perfectly round puri. He held it up, displaying a translucent, thin, but not too thin, petty of dough. Make them like this, he said, but hurry. On discovering that the dough was too stiff, Swamiji added a little ghee and then a little milk and kneaded the dough to a softer texture. Everything should be just right, he said, and his disciples took to their menial tasks with concentrated earnestness. Who among them had ever heard of these things before, puris and samosas? It was all new and a challenge, sometimes very important. It was a part of devotional service. Swamiji did much of the cooking as he simultaneously supervised his helpers. He was always near, walking barefoot back to the kitchen, then to the front room, then to his own room in the rear. And even when he went to his back room, his disciples could see him through the window of the wall. Swamiji saw each of the nearly one dozen dishes through its final stages, and his disciples carried them into the front room in pots, one by one, and placed them before the picture of Lord Chaitanya. There was halava, dal, two sabjis, fancy rice, puris, samosas, sweet rice, apple chutney, and gulab jamuns or sweet balls, iskon bullets. Prabhupada had personally spent much time slowly deep frying the sweet balls on a low heat until they had turned golden brown and full. Then, one by one, he had lifted them out of the ghee with a slotted spoon and put them to soak in sugar syrup. He recognized that these golden ghee fried milk balls soaked with sugar, soaked with sugar water, were his disciples' favorite prasadam treat. He called them Iskon bullets because they were weapons in the war against Maya. He even allowed that the jar of Iskon bullets floating in their syrup be always on hand in the front room where his disciples could take them without asking permission and without observing any regulated hours. They could take as many as they liked. So Prabhupada didn't want his disciples to take food outside, to, to take food which is not offered to Krishna. So he arranged this gulab jamuns, <laughs> the, the iskon bullets, so that always when they want, they could take the, the sweets and not, not have to go to the bakery or sweet shop and buy something. He was so much concerned and he gave so much emphasis on prashadam. He said that uh, if we are not attached to, to Lord Krishna, to, to Lord Narayan, that uh, we, we need to purify ourselves and that the service begins with the tongue. And that, that's why prashadam is very important. And he said, if you say, I want to do service, I, and you stretch the arms, and you say, I want to do something. But he said, no, first, we, we, we conquer the senses, but we start with the tongue. Seva muke hi jiva jo. So, this is very interesting. We, we don't... The first is the tongue, and then the other senses. And it was... For me, it was really like this. I, I didn't have any... I was atheistic, I didn't have any interest in God. I was ridiculing people who were speaking about God. But I got in the street of Zagreb where I lived, I got a small sweet ball from devotees who were distributing prashadam. One Mataji gave me. And this was my beginning of devotional service. 
and then gradually and then later I, I got to know I was living in Prague and I got to know that there is a Govinda's restaurant and I came there and I took prasad and it, and it was so good and I had to come again and again and then when I moved to Germany I was always thinking oh I'm missing this good food and when they invited me for the program I, I relished so much this prasadam so this is really what Prabhupada wanted and uh, yeah he said that people who who don't uh, who don't have uh, that some people don't take prasadam they are, they are uh, very very unfortunate because they have, don't have this inclination Mm -hmm. Kirtanananda brought in the samosa filling which he had prepared from spinach and green peas cooked to a paste and which the Swami had heavily spiced. Stuffing the samosas was an art and Swamiji showed them how to do it. He took a semicircle of dough, shaped it into a cone, stuffed it with a spoon full of filling and then folded the top over and sealed it. A samosa ready for the hot ghee. Achutananda carried the imperfectly shaped puris into the kitchen where he and Kirtanananda deep fried them two at a time. If the temperature of the ghee, the consistency of the dough and the size, shape and thickness of the puris were all just right the puris would cook in only a few seconds, rising to the surface of the ghee, where they, were, where they would inflate like little balloons. The cooks then stood them on edge in a cardboard box to drain off the excess ghee. As they completed the last preparations for the feast, Swamiji's disciples washed the stiff dough from their hands and went down to the storefront where they set out the straw mats and awaited the guests and the feast. Upstairs, Swamiji and a couple of his cooks offered all the preparations to Lord Chaitanya, reciting the Parampara prayer. The first few love feasts were not very well attended, but the devotees were so enthusiastic about the feast prasadam that they showed no disappointment over the scarcity of guests. <laughs> they were prepared to eat everything. <laughs> Sasvaru. There was something called Brahmana spaghetti, which was rice flour noodles cooked in ghee and soaked in sugar water. And there was halava Pushpana rice with fried cheese balls, samosas, split mung beans fried into crunchy pellets. Samosas, split mung beans fried into crunchy pellets and mixed with salt and spices, puris, gulab jamuns. And everything was succulent. That was the word Hayagriva used. Yes, he would say, expressing it waggishly. Everything was very succulent. Anybody knows what is succulent? Yes. Juicy. Juicy. Uh huh. Thank you. Eating the feast was an intense experience. We were supposed to be subduing our senses all week, following strict regulations, controlling the tongue. And the feast was a kind of reward. Swamiji and Krishna were giving us a taste of full spiritual ecstasy, even though we were still beginners and still in the material world. Before taking my plate full, I would pray, please let me remain in Krishna consciousness because it is so nice and I am so fallen. Let me serve Swamiji and let me now enjoy this feast in transcendental bliss. And I would begin eating going from one taste sensation to another. The good rice, the favorite vegetable, the bread, and saving the gulab jamun for last, thinking, 
I can have seconds, and if I like thirds, we would keep our eyes on the big pots, confident that there was as, as much as we wanted. It was a time of rededication. We enjoyed with completely open relish and sent gratification. Eating was very important. Gradually, attendance picked up. The feasts were free and they were reputed to be delicious. Mostly, local hippies came, but occasionally a higher class of experimenting New Yorkers or even the parents of one of the devotees would come. When the small temple was filled, guests would sit in the courtyard. They would take their prashadam, laden paper plates and their wooden spoons into the backyard garden and sit beneath the fire escape or at the picnic table or anywhere. And after eating, they would go back into the storefront for more. Devotees were stationed behind the pots of prasadam and the guests would come by for seconds. The other tenants were not happy about seeing the courtyard full of festive guests and the devotees tried to pacify them by bringing them plates of prasadam. Although Swamiji would not go down to the temple, he would take a plate in his room and hear with pleasure about the success of his new program. One time the devotees were eating so ravenously that they threatened to eat everything available before the guests had all been served. And Kirtanananda had to admonish them for, this, for their selfish attitude. Gradually, they were understanding that the Sunday feast was not just for their fun and pleasure, but to bring people to Krishna consciousness. So th this is, for me, th that was very, um, very attractive, this, this uh, part of Krishna consciousness, <laughs> the prasadam, because devotees were serving with so much heart. Like I was meeting before some other groups of spiritualists and some different groups and chanting the mantras and learning, but the devotees really had the heart to, to serve, to feed me like till I was full. I, was have, I would have one plate and they would come and say, please come, take more, take more. And they would pour and I could feel this love. What, what, Prabhupada gave us this, this hospitality of, of, of Vedic culture which Prabhupada gave, brought us from India. This is what I was looking for when I was on studying outside my country, far from my family. I looked for this love and this is what, I, what attracted me to Krishna consciousness. And I remember I was in one uh, festival in, in the Simhadev's temple in Germany, in Simhachalam. And there was Prabhupada's disciple Manidar, and he was speaking to a, to a full room of, of young devotees. And he would say, I saw you how you are taking prasadam. This is nothing. When, when I joined, we would have the balls, like the balls you are serving prasadam from. And we would eat from such bowls and we would take more and more until we were so full that we would just roll over and couldn't move anymore. It was so much motivating devotees to, to take prasadam. Okay, so let's read a little bit more. Any, any comments from you on this part? Prabhupada had begun Back to Godhead magazine in India, although he had been writing articles since the 1930s. It was in 1944 in Kolkata that he had single-handedly begun the magazine in response to his spiritual master's request that he preach Krishna consciousness in English. It had been with great difficulty that through his permissibility pharmaceutical business, he had managed 
to gather the 400 rupees a month for printing. And he had single-handedly written, edited, published, financed and distributed each issue. In those early years, Back to Godhead had been Prabhupada's major literary work and preaching mission. He had envisioned widespread distribution of the magazine and he had thought of plans for spreading the message of Lord Chaitanya all over the world. He had drawn up a list of major countries and the number of copies of Back to Godhead he wanted to send to each. He sought donations to finance this project, but help was scarce. Then, in 1959, he had turned his energies towards writing and publishing the Srimad Bhagavatam. But now he wanted to revive Back to Godhead, and this time it would not be single-handedly. It would not be done single-handedly. This time he would give the responsibility to his disciples. Greg Sharp, now Gargamuni, since his recent initiation, found a press. A country club in Queens was trying to sell its small A.B. Dick press. Prabhupada was interested and he rode out to Queens in a borrowed van with Gargamuni at Kirtanananda to see the machine. It was old, but in good condition. The manager of the country club wanted $250 for it. Prabhupada looked over the machine carefully and talked with the manager, telling him of his spiritual mission. The manager mentioned a second press he had on hand and explained that neither machine was actually of any use to him. So Prabhupada said he would pay $250 for both machines. The country club did not really need them, and besides, the manager should help out, since Prabhupada had an important spiritual message to print for the benefit of all humanity. The man agreed. Prabhupada had Gargamuni and Kirtanananda load both machines into the van and ISKCON had its printing press. It's amazing how Prabhupada, he, he bargained here for, he took two machines for the same, the price what was for one machine. I heard the story when he was starting in New York, he even went to the supermarket and he didn't have much money at the time and he bought some vegetables and some boga to, to cook and the, the lady on the, on the uh, uh, counter, she, she uh, put on the, how do you say, a uh, uh, cashier. Uh, cashier, she told him, she, she calculated the price and she told the price and Prabhupada said, <laughs> he lowered the price. In the supermarket, he said, no, give me for, I don't know, half or whatever. <laughs> and she said, okay, she, he has so much potency, he could do that. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada gave over the editorship of Back to Godhead magazine to Haya Griba and Raya Ram. For so many years, he had taken back, he had taken Back to Godhead as his personal service to his spiritual master. But now, he would let young men like Haya Griva the college English teacher, and Raya Ram, the professional writer, take up Back to Godhead magazine as their service to their spiritual master. In a short time, Haraya Griva and Raya Ram had compiled the first issue and were ready to print. It was an off night, no public kirtan lecture, and Swamiji was up in his room working on his translation of Srimad Bhagavatam. Downstairs, the printing of the first issue had been going on for hours. Raya Ram had typed the stencils and during the printing he had stood nervously over the machine, examining the printing quality of each page, stroking his beard and murmuring, Hmm. Now it was time to collate and staple each magazine. The stencils had lasted for 100 copies, 
and 100 copies of each of the 28 pages and the front and back covers were now lined up along two of the unvarnished benches Raphael had made that summer. A few devotees collated and stapled the magazine in an assembly line, walking along the stacks of pages, taking one page under another until they reached the end of the bench and gave the assembled stack of pages to Gargamuni, who stood brushing his long hair out of his eyes, stapling each magazine with the stapler and staples Ramananda had brought from his Board of Education office. Even Hayagriva, who usually didn't volunteer for menial duties, was there, walking down the line, collating. Suddenly, the side door opened, and to their surprise, they saw Swamiji looking in at them. Then, he opened the door wide and entered the room. He had never come down like this on an off night before. They felt an unexpected flush of emotion and love for him, and they dropped down on their knees, bowing their heads to the floor. No, no, he said, raising his hand to stop them, as some were still bowing and others already rising to their feet. Continue what you are doing. When they stood up and saw him standing with them, they weren't sure what to do. But obviously he had come down to see them producing his Back to Godhead magazine. So they continued working silently and efficiently. Prabhupada walked down to the row of pages, his hand and wrist extending gracefully from the folds of his shawl as he touched a stack of pages and then a finished magazine. Is compress, he said. So, how dedicated was Prabhupada and his disciples to work so hard, to work in the night, to, to he was sleeping just a couple of hours a night, translating, overseeing everything, just to, to give the message to us in the West. How big hearts had Prabhupada to, do, to take all these difficulties, to come here and to bring me and to, to bring us the message of Krishna. That there is God, I didn't know God, I didn't believe God, I was making jokes and fun of people who were, who were speaking of God. I was living a completely irregulated, sinful life of, of intoxication, alcoholism, illicit sex, everything. And all this, I, Prabhupada saved me from all this. And now I can be here in a temple with devotees, I can do the service which is, gives so much pleasure. Krishna, really, I feel that Krishna is listening to me. Krishna is in my heart and He is giving me services which are fill, fulfilling my personal needs. I, I didn't, I was playing music before professionally. I didn't really do much with, with, with colors, with art, for, with forms, but I got the, the, the service of dressing Shishi Gornitai by, by Mr. Srila Prabhupada. And it, be, it becomes so absorbing. I, I would look at the colors, imagine what colors I can put, how to shape the dresses, how to pin them. And it, I, I was so absorbed, I would not think of anything else. And it's, such a wonderful thing and to think that I'm serving God and that I'm the, the servant of God and that that we are connected, that that there is God in my heart, that I'm eternal, that this life, this body will end, but I'm continuing as a servant of God. It's such a beautiful thing. And thank you, Srila Prabhupada. Thank all Prabhupada disciples, thank all devotees for giving for saving my life and giving the meaning to my life. Hare Krishna, thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any comments or questions? No, no 
Pantone. No, he, he wanted to know what is the Panchatalva painting, you know, like Panchatalva. So I told him, I don't know, we, have a, we don't have a painting of Panchatalva, but we have There is one, it. just when we outside the outside. temple, there is one painting. And the original Panchatatva painting, which they worshipped in this uh, uh, storefront in New York, this original painting in, is in Sarcel, next to Paris, in the temple. Temple, you can see there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada Nilamne Taki Jai. Shla Prabhupada Ki Jai. Satsvarup Das Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai. Nitai Gaur Premanande.